in April, there was a, a peace outreach by Putin and by and Zelensky, and they actually signed a peace agreement. And at that time, and the uh, and Boris Johnson was dispatched by the White House to sabotage that agreement. The Russians were acting in good faith after signing that agreement. They were actually withdrawing troops from the area around Kiev. So it was clear that they were operating in good faith at that point, and we were not operating in good faith. We should be trying to settle this war through dipl diplomacy. Since then, there have been 350,000 Ukrainian kids that have been killed. What is the significance of Putin's first ever publicly stated peace offer for Ukraine? Why is he doing this now? More importantly, how different is it to the peace terms that Russia and Ukraine engaged in in 2022? Is this to be seen as a sort of last chance gesture to Ukraine ahead of a major escalation by Russia? Or is it, as some NATO officials have stated, a sign of desperation from the Russian president? It is very clear that Russia has clearly, they're very desperate. They have already experienced a strategic failure. Well, if we look at the front line, the latter perspective seems quite dubious. On June the 15th, while public attention turned to Moscow's offensive in Kharkiv, Several media outlets, including from Vietnam, reported that Russian forces still advance slowly and firmly into the Donbass region of eastern Ukraine, which remains Moscow's main target, as confirmed by Ukraine's Kiev Independent. The Russian army gained more than a dozen small villages and approached the town of Chasivyar. What has been absent from Western media is the fact that the town of Ivaniski, which is located on the highway between Bakhmut and Chasivyar, was at that time facing a serious risk of capture and which was a town that Russia had entered since February of this year. According to the Kiev Independent, resources were still scarce and Ukraine's units were being thinly dispersed on the changing front. On the 11th of June, the Russian Defense Ministry reported that the units continued to advance and control the village of Staromayorsky in the Zaporizhia region after capturing Rubotini. The Kiev regime, however, did not comment on this information. Then there was a claim from Chechen warlord Ramzan Kadyrov that Russia had infiltrated the Sumy region and captured the border village of Rizivka. However, this was again denied by President Zelensky and no further reports have come out since to confirm or deny this allegation. Then there is the recent escalation by the West to allow Ukraine to use Western weapons to attack deep inside Russia. So has this in any way led to President Putin's peace deal offer? Again, it seems unlikely, according to Dr. Mark Episcopos, a Eurasian researcher at the Quincy State Management Institute in the United States of America, who said that allowing Ukraine to use Western weapons to attack Russian territory will not lead to a change on the situation on the battlefield. In quotations, he said, the decision does not solve two main reasons why Ukraine is on the path to failure, a shortage of manpower and firepower. The imminent capture of Ivaniski was confirmed on June 11th, however, by Newsweek reported overall that Russia was advancing in eastern Ukraine and gained the territory along several points along the front line in Donetsk. It reported that the town of Ivaniski was seized on the 10th by Russia, according to a Ukrainian war blogger popularly known as Deep State UA, but that this was denied by Ukraine. However, Ukrainian newspaper Ukrainska Pravda also confirmed the capture of Ivaniski on June 11th, while also reporting that the contact line in Kleshivka, south of Bakhmut, had also changed. So with the confirmed Russian advances all along the front, particularly in the Donbass, along with the assessment that Ukraine's ability to strike inside Russia will not assist their major shortcomings nor help them win the war, it does seem that President Putin is giving Ukraine a last chance at peace on terms which will arguably allow Ukraine to survive as a nation even if diminished by four regions. So let's get into it. <laughs> Putin's peace plan offer to Ukraine was given in a televised address. Ukrainian войска должны быть полностью выведены из Донецкой, Луганской народных республик, Херсонской и Запорожской областей. Причем обращаю внимание именно со всей территории этих регионов в пределах их административных границ, которые существовали на момент их вождения в Украину. Как только в Киеве заявят о том, что готовы к такому решению и начнут реальный вывод войск из этих регионов, а также официально уведомят об отказе от планов вступления в НАТО, с нашей стороны незамедлительно, буквально в ту же минуту, последует приказ прекратить огонь и начать переговоры. Повторю, мы это сделаем незамедлительно. In essence, it requires that Ukraine withdraw all troops from the four regions that Russia annexed in 2022 while announcing its abandonment of its plan to join NATO. 
Once that occurs, President Putin assures that Russia will immediately begin to establish a ceasefire and begin negotiations. These terms are in some respects quite similar to the discussions in Istanbul in 2022, which was the first major chance to end the war and which was thwarted by the then English Prime Minister Boris Johnson, as revealed by a Ukrainian newspaper, Ukrainska Pravda, in an article published since the 5th of May 2022. In that report, it was stated that the Russian side was actually ready for the Zelensky-Putin meeting and that one of the reasons it was thwarted was the arrival of British Prime Minister Boris Johnson on April 9th, who stated, and I quote, even if Ukraine is ready to sign some agreements on guarantees with President Putin, they, and by this he spoke of the collective West, are not. And let me give you some more context. Boris Johnson also said this, the collective West now felt that Putin was not really as powerful as they had previously imagined and that there was a chance to press him. Three days after Boris Johnson left to return to Britain, Putin went public and said that the talks with Ukraine had turned into a dead end. I was in that moment in the group of Ukrainian negotiators. We negotiate uh, with the Russian delegation practically two months, in March and April, the possible peaceful settlement agreement with, between Ukraine and Russia. And we, as you remember, concluded so-called Istanbul communique. And we were very close in the middle of April, in the end of April, to finalize our war with some peaceful settlement. For some reasons, it was postponed, but to my mind, Putin, this is my personal view, Putin in one week after started his aggression in 24 February last year, very quickly understood he did mistake and tried to do everything possible to conclude agreement with Ukraine. And Istanbul communique, it was his personal decision to accept the text of this communique, which totally far away from the initial proposal of Russia, ultimatum proposal of Russia, which they put before the Ukrainian delegation in Minsk. For most of the war, the Istanbul peace plan was for a long time hidden from Western media, but now it is being discussed in the mainstream. New York Times published on the 15th of June a full draft of the Ukraine-Russia Treaty from April of 2022 and stated that the issues that would need to be tackled in any future peace settlement are evidenced and in fact were at the center of negotiations two years ago that explored peace terms in remarkable detail. However, the newspaper incorrectly blames the failure of the peace talks to the fact that both sides are dubbing on the battlefield instead of referencing the West's unilateral decision to end it, motivated by the selfish hopes of weakening President Putin and Russia while expanding NATO, which by most sensible accounts is currently failing. On April the 15th of 2022, New York Times reports that both sides had agreed to exclude Crimea from the treaty, leaving it under Russian control, but without Ukraine recognizing it. Most importantly, Ukrainian negotiators offered to forego NATO membership and to accept Russian occupation of parts of their territory, but refused to recognize Russian sovereignty over them. Quite amazingly, Ukraine also proposed never joining NATO or other alliances, according to the New York Times. This, my friends, seems awfully similar to what President Putin offered in his most recent and public peace offer. Russia had also demanded in 2022 that Ukraine make Russia the official language of Ukraine. So given the similarity between the two peace deals, the former, which Ukraine was ready to accept, save for the West's interdiction, then why is President Zelensky and his Western allies calling Putin's offer absurd and manipulative, according to French media? The Ukraine Ministry of Defense outright rejected the peace proposal in a statement which read as follows. It is absurd for Putin, who planned, prepared, and executed the largest armed aggression in Europe to present himself as a peacemaker and to put forward options for ending the war that he started. Asia Times noted that the Istanbul peace offer, also known as the Istanbul Communique of 2022, was achieved at the time when Russia pulled back its forces from the attempt to surround Kiev, and as confirmed earlier by Ukraine's Kapravda, Asia Times states that Ukraine was persuaded to pull out of the deal when its Western allies, principally the United Kingdom and the United States, opposed it. The peace offer proposed to grant Ukraine security guarantees from Russia and other countries such as Israel, Poland, Italy, Germany and Canada. 
which were far more precise than the Article 5 of the NATO Treaty, as the Istanbul deal would have allowed each guarantor state to take action in Kiev's defense independently without requiring the assent of the others as is consistent with NATO's Article 5. The notable difference between 2022 and now is that back then, Putin was willing to trade territory taken by the Russians in the land bridge for making Ukraine neutral and removing NATO's presence. The US, of course, was not willing to give security guarantees to Ukraine, as this would mean the end of NATO expansion. As it stands, Asia Times views that the US would not consider negotiations over Ukraine's future right now, because the Russians are winning, and hope instead to try to help Ukraine achieve some breakthroughs against Russia by ramping up attacks on Russian territory. Assuming continued massive NATO and US support, new weapons including fighter jets and perhaps an increased presence of NATO troops, Washington thinks the Russians can be stopped in their tracks and some of their gains perhaps reversed. This would then open a path toward negotiations aimed at a ceasefire that the Russians may accept. A ceasefire would then give Ukraine time to replenish its military manpower and absorb new weapons helped out by a limited NATO troop presence in the country. From this, a temporary stalemate would turn into a future opportunity that might force the Russians to pull out of Ukraine altogether. Of course, at present, this Western plan seems quite far-fetched as Russia continues to advance at a slow pace. And as to that slow advance, in a recent meeting in St. Petersburg, President Putin was asked why not speed up the effort to Ukraine before NATO sends weapons and troops. And his response was vaguely this, that the Russian troops were following a plan that would continue at the current pace. In short, the Russian president did not see an urgency in the war. But the point is, that Putin must know that the US will not accept his peace offer and further, Russia itself cannot accept any terms that mean giving back any of the four regions it has annexed, as this would pose significant political challenges in Russia. So Asia Time concludes that any peace talks now would be more smoke and there are no mirrors. So I ask, why did President Putin offer a peace deal similar in terms to the Istanbul communique, save for the fact that Russia will now be keeping its four annexed regions? Was it for a propaganda victory to show that it is the West and not Russia who is the real warmonger? Maybe it was an appeal to the Ukrainian citizens to distance themselves from President Zelensky, who seems totally bought by his Western allies and fomenting war. But given the trajectory of the battlefield as is set out earlier, and the fact that West has no plan that can fix Ukraine's firepower and manpower shortages, my conclusion is that this was Putin's final olive branch to Ukraine before the eventual military destruction of Kiev.